pictures think about the you know, uh, the sustainable development goals in terms of these pictures that's a torture this is great now students on the idea of conscience when you are also talking about sustainability and just hold on for a while uh, this is a slide that you know if you read it carefully throws question on our on our we just can you show that picture the last one It's a question mark. It's a criticism of the nature of education, whichever, wherever it is, whether it's primary school, secondary school, or universities. Also, universities should be centers for critical education. This is uh, genocide survivor. The Jews were killed, and this is a survivor. Let's come back to uh, sustainable development goals. Yes. Can you just put? I have not prepared a PowerPoint, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to just put the paper. You can read it. I'm going to read it out. Hopefully, you don't sleep. <laughs> If you are feeling too sleepy, let's do some exercise. No, nothing. You just uh, follow me and. Uh, Can you make it bigger? Go up. No, go up. Hey, we go to the sorry, the first, the first page, first page. Yeah, okay. So um, let me start it off. In the, the the main observations and uh, uh, my concerns. The world is badly broken. All our efforts, including the Sustainable Development Goals, focused on the desire for growth and the false certainty, clarity of disciplinary silos thinking, are not helping us much. The cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, the suffering of all sentient beings, and the continued destruction of the life-supporting biosphere, is only intensifying. Observe Earth. Overshoot day, which is coming closer to January, and nine, the nine planetary limits is not really improving. Young people are beginning to voice out the mess. World leaders, political leaders, business leaders, academic leaders have created in relation to their present and their futures. Very recently, millions of young people. 
took to the streets the world over. He captured the voice of the younger generation, which in no uncertain terms tells us how selfish, careless, blind, incompetent, and unprepared we are to the urgent problems of the world, urgent problems they are facing, and they are going to face in the future as young people grow older. No wonder why we are now in a state of eco-social emergency. The IPCC 2018 report gives, a, gives 12 years before we face massive ecological collapse. It is high time we stop looking at our bank balance so that we may examine our conscience. We need to engage <coughs> or promote the process of conscientization, transformative learning and disruptive schooling to unlearn, to let go and relearn. The world needs radically new narratives, new stories, new lifestyles, new institutions, new ways of knowing and being. The rack to riches stories are not helpful anymore because they are ecologically very costly. We really don't need that, we really do, don't need that in the midst of not only a material crisis, but also a moral and spiritual crisis. The, the crisis we are faced here is not just material, right? it's not about just some goals, it is a moral and spiritual crisis too. So globally in the long term, business as usual and business as always are not going to help us anymore. So are we ready to tread light, uh, lightly on Mother Earth? Are we really ready to ensure that no one, humans and non-humans, is left behind in principle and practice? We have been discussing the whole morning and it seems to be we only concerned about the human world. What about the non-human world, about the trees, plants? And <clears throat> okay, so that is my concern. Okay, my concern for this presentation. But let me just start the narrative. Uh, the presentation narrative, I do not know I have time to finish it, but let me try my best. First, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, Professor Misuno and all connected with organizing this uh, gathering in our effort to reshape the, reshape a better world. I deeply appreciate this effort. I think a lot of these efforts are going on and, and, and it is necessary. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some cautionary and critical remarks on the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. It is my understanding that we are living in a very broken world. We have increased sites of pain and suffering, destruction and death across the world. Biodiversity, extinction, forest cover, environmental toxins, slavery, refugees, genocides, ecocides, conflicts, wars, ill-being, inequality, stress and unhappiness. And let me also mention waste and including electronic waste, whether hardware or software. It's not that data is always eco-friendly. Eco data can lead to a lot of increase in temperature. So you would please look at data as also a waste. <coughs> Sorry. I am also among those who do not have much faith or optimism on their sustainable development goals. We will have a lot of activities from this global and globalizing agenda, but we cannot really address the complex challenges of a collapsing world in which we have put our children and youth. Even though we have made life convenient here and there, we have consciously or unconsciously brought into the world, into, brought them into the world, faced with crises of neoliberalism growth of virulent global fascism, collapsing biosphere and climate emergency, and a slow weaponization and militarization of everyday life. SDGs cannot attend to this mess. SDG alone cannot attend to this mess we have created. And if you want to look, look at the military figures, the arms, arms sales figure, how, much of, how many countries are making how much of money uh, on just selling weapons to kill the other. <coughs> In 
In presenting my case, I draw upon two sources, my earlier and continuing deliberations addressing my difficulty with the hegemonic notions of sustainable development proposed by international bodies, disregarding internet in indigenous wisdom, notions and practices of sustainability. For me, this difficulty has grown into my non-acceptance of the sustainable development goals and its global agenda as given for it recognizes no moral or spiritual crisis. It proposes mere technical solutions. So I see the, the challenges we face today as more, both as, as also moral and spiritual and we have to attend to that. That is my first and uh, that, is, that is the time I met uh, Professor Visano. Uh, presenting a relationship between <laughs> sustainability and spirituality. <clears throat> my second is uh, my present uh, concerns, present ongoing research exploration. My present ongoing concerns, exploration and research are into two global seduction. We are seduced. The seduction of growth and more growth. I think that was referred to <laughs> in the morning too. And the second is the seduction of disciplinarity, a limiting historical mode of production. Discip uh, disciplines and disciplinarity is a historical stage of how we produce knowledge. We got stuck with one stage. The desire for the first has led to the global to a global cancerous situation that we continue to carelessly feed. Growth and growth for the sake of growth is very, very disastrous. The second disciplinarity has created a hegemonic and caricatured world uh, presented to us as scientific knowledge. It is a mode of production of knowledge that is arrogant and pretends a godlike posture. I am more and more convinced that of what SDGs really are. They have come to give the challenged glo global accumulation process another global fillip and save late capitalism from being transformed deeply. Ironically, the SDGs are supposed to contribute to a global transformation program, but they actually ensure that we remain on the same track. Certainly, it is not going to be business as usual, but rest assured, it will be business as always. I am also, I am also more concerned for the community that genuinely desires to transform the future. The saddest part of this whole global human drama is how successfully the SDG has mobilized our compassion for a better, safer, and just world. For me. The concerns of ordinary people for the suffering of the other, our compassion for the human and non-human, as well as living and non-living world is being hijacked by our addiction and seduction to growth and disciplinary knowledge silos. I, uh, I mean, if you look, go back and study, study the literatures of the, uh, of, of the growing criticism on SDGs, there are ideological, there are economic, ideological, and feminist critics. This is a growing body of knowledge to SDGs, and I and, and he has mentioned also something in relation to the growing, growing critique on SDGs. So we have to pay attention. We all seem to have jumped into this bandwagon without critically examining SDGs, and pe and young people, these two young scholars, have produced theses on uh, ideological and feminist critique. And so I'm, I'm taking only one part, I'm looking at the growth, this whole idea of growth. In Jacobin, a voice of the American left, an article appeared in 2015, entitled, entitled The Problem of Saving the World. Let me read it out. <laughs> you, you please follow it. The core of the SDG program for development and poverty reduction relies precisely on the old model of industrial growth ever increasing levels of extraction, production and consumption. And not just a little bit of growth, they want at least 7% annual GDP growth in, le in, in least developed countries and higher levels of economic productivity across the board. In fact, the entire goal, goal 8 is devoted to growth, especially export oriented uh, growth in keeping with existing new liberal models. So it is 
SDG is not a technical process, it's also an ideological framework. What does this really mean? The SDG the SDGs contradictory relationship to growth extends to its approach to global poverty. The zero draft promotes growth as the main solution to poverty. But these relationships are highly tenuous. Of all the of all the income generated by global GDP between 1999 and 2008, the poorest 60% of humanity received only 5%. If you go and look at the global statistic of inequality, you will understand this seriousness of the distribution of wealth. Given the existing ratio between GDP growth and the income growth of the pure poorest, it will take 207 years to eliminate poverty with this strategy and to get there, we will have to grow the global economy 175 times to its present size. This is a terrifying thing to contemplate. With the present growth, we have already created a situation of a equal, equal and social collapse. Imagine you expand the world economy, global economy, 175 times to take care of the global poverty and violence and all that that they claim. You have to grow this economy to such a size that the metabolism of this planet is, is a god. I mean, we are going to destroy this planet. We are not going to survive this. We are not going to survive as a civilization. That is the that is the danger of this uh, framework. It comes from a particular view of the world. No, uh, uh, Okay, uh, since I uh, don't wind up, let me just see. Uh, so the SDG are not sources of, of new narratives or different futures, for it recognizes no critical, material, moral, or spiritual crisis. The meta theory we will come to live by under SDG regime is the same as the old one, guiding uh, individuals and nations, liquidate earth, turn it into property and prosperity and flourish. So let me just skip some of these uh, areas. Uh, okay, let me just go on to... Excuse me, sorry, I just want to wind it up. So if, if we... To, the basic thing, if you want to look at there are a number of things there, but if you want to look at some of the things to reconsider, you may want to look at you may you want to look at this some of the things that uh, uh, the SDG framework uh, is you know the SDG framework is so focused on poverty. Why not affluence? Why are we not ex ex examining the affluence? Of course, I think that it will work finally work out too. But why are we focused on it? affluence? Is a problem today. The way the world is skewed in terms of wealth and its distribution, we have to look start looking at uh, affluence, critically interrogate affluence. We need to interrogate maximum wage. You look at income differential between the you know, the lowest paid and the highest paid. It's, it's going crazy, 100, 200, 300 times. So. There, these are some questions I'm, I'm saying that if you, want to, if you want new narratives, you have to turn, you have to go back to asking some basic questions. So these are some of the basic questions you can ask. Now let me wind it up. Another uh, maybe uh, two, three minutes. I strongly believe that our destructive, our destructive uh, desires have taken us towards self and other destruction. And this destructive part is based on defective knowledge of who we are and how we are intimately connected to each other and the rest of the world. There is no sociology or economics or political science out there in the real world. It is not a mechanical world with clear causes and effects. We do not live in a unidimensional reality. 
The complexity out there is deeply interconnected, interdependent, multi-layered, multi-functional, multi-directional, multi-temporal, multi-species, material and spiritual and continuously emergent. New things are coming. We will not really have an understanding of this complexity by using the present mode of knowledge production we have developed. It is historically primitive and still evolving. But unfortunately, we are making critical decisions based on the knowledge produced by disciplinarity and its uh, uh, cousins, uh, multidisciplinarity, and of course, a better one is the interdisciplinarity. University or university associated knowledge producers have become hegemonic and carelessly set the standard and criteria for what knowledge is and what it is not. They have been challenges to this arrogance. Historically, I think there have been a movement from university to multiversity to, to now transversity. Disciplinary promote, promoted its institutional preservation and continuity through university. This become refined, ahistorical. Generations were schooled through this mode of engaging with the world and mode of production of knowledge. Learning transformed into education and education <coughs> into industry. Universities become, uh, became knowledge factories with disciplinary, disciplinary products and assembly lines of students. The challenge to this historical stage was the growth of multiversities influenced by such notions as conscientization and de-schooling. It is largely a movement in the developing world. It questioned the hegemony of Western knowledge production. It challenged the tyranny of experts and their approaches. It attempted to recapture indigenous traditions of engaging with nature and knowledge production. It ap approached its approach went beyond disciplinarity and more at home with interdisciplinarity orientation and what is now being developed as transdisciplinarity. This has led to thinking about its institutional form, transversity. So the suggestion is that we have to start moving this knowledge production processes from university kind of environment or ecology to a transversity kind of ecology. My firm belief, I'll finish it with this last paragraph. My firm belief is that for us to engage with present challenges, problems, and data dangers, we need to transform our universities over time from two multiversities and transversities. One of the critical aims should be to engage with not just university uh, knowledge producers, but also with other non academic knowledge co producers. In particular, we have to learn a lot. Uh, we have to learn a lot from the elders of many endangered indigenous <laughs> communities. Thank you.